and welcome to Marito's History Corner's fifth video. Today we're going to talk about Jane Seymour and Anne of Cleves. Jane was one of three surviving daughters of Sir John and Marjorie, Lady Seymour. Her birth date was not recorded, but was probably between 1507 and 1508. The Seymours, although of ancient lineage, were not important in national affairs. Concentrating on solid service to the crown in their home county of Wiltshire, where Sir John, as well as serving as sheriff, were the hereditary warden of Severnake Forest. Jane's mother was a descendant from Edward III, half cousin to Elizabeth Tilney, Countess of Surrey, and a noted beauty in the court of Henry VII. Like the rest of her siblings, Jane was probably born at the family home at Woolfall, Wiltshire. Nothing definite is known about Jane's education. She could read and write and probably spoke some French, still widely used among the upper class, but she appears not to have received the modern humanist education that her predecessors as Henry's wives did. What Jane would have learned were skills as a gentlewoman, who would expect to marry someone of her own class and run a country estate, supervising a large household of indoor staff and senior estate workers, such as stewards and bailiff. This type of education included accounting, some law, fine cookery, management of dairy, needlework of all kinds, the use of herbs for medicinal purposes, and the tenets of her religion. Hunting and hawking, dancing and playing musical instrument were also featured. When Jane was about seven, her eldest surviving brother Edward started his career at court. First with a position in the household of Princess Mary, daughter of Henry VII, who was married in 1415 to Louis XII of France. Edward went in her retinue to France and remained there until the widow Mary's return the following year. Jane passed the usual age for marriage for a gentlewoman of late teens to early twenties. There is no evidence of any match being sought. This is surprising, as even if Jane herself were not a great beauty, personal attraction was hardly a basis for marriage. It was an economical or political matter arranged by the couple's parents or guardians. Perhaps Jane didn't have a sufficient dowry to attract an eligible match. Jane's mother, not a regular lady-in-waiting, attended the Queen on important state occasions and may have introduced her daughter to Catherine's notice. Similarly, other relatives may have requested a place for her. In particular, Sir Francis Bryan, her half-second cousin. Sir Francis certainly supported Jane's career later. Although there is no proof that Jane served Catherine, her attitude to Catherine and her daughter Mary later suggested that she did indeed have a position with the Queen in the late 1520s, when Henry had already sought an annulment and Jane's fellow maid of honor Anne Boleyn was the focus of the King's passion. Anne was also a second cousin of Jane's. In 1531, Catherine was exiled. It is unknown whether Jane accompanied her mistress to the moor, the house in Hertfordshire to which she was sent. On January 1st, 1534, Henry VIII gave his customary New Year's presents. One of the recipients was Mistress Seymour. In 1534, Sir Robert Dormer was approached by Sir Francis Bryan to suggest a match between Sir Robert's son William and Jane. According to the record, Sir John's wife rejected the idea out of hand and quickly arranged for William to marry elsewhere. We cannot say with certainty anything at all about Jane from her birth until September 1535 when she definitely was in the retinue of Anne Boleyn. During that month, 
Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn visited Wolf Hall as part of their summer progress. Whilst it is possible that Henry had first noticed Jane in early 1535, it is in the autumn of that year that the first is evidence that he was pursuing her. The court returned to London, and Henry's attention to Jane became so marked that many observers, including the imperial ambassador Chapoy, thought that Jane might eclipse Anne in the king's favor. As Anne fell pregnant that autumn, and Catherine was still alive, there was no thought of Jane replacing Anne as queen. However, the role of king's mistress was now vacant. Jane, whether from natural inclination, ambition, or family instruction, coyly declined Henry's advances. Just as rejection had increased Henry's passion for Anne Boleyn, so it enhanced his interest for Jane. The court was watching, as Jane was believed to be a firm supporter of Catherine and Princess Mary, and was thus a natural focus of Anne Boleyn's legion of enemies. In January 1536, Catherine of Aragon died, and Anne's position, far from being strengthened, was now weaker. Whilst Catherine lived, Henry couldn't feasibly reject his second wife. but. If Anne did not keep what Henry perceived to be her part of the bargain and deliver a son, he would take steps to get rid of her. On January 29th that year, Anne miscarried, and in her grief alleged that part of the miscarriage was due to the shock of seeing Jane sitting in Henry's lap. Her enemies immediately sent her blood, and saw the promotion of Jane as an excellent means to unseating her. Towards the end of March, Henry sent Jane a present of money, by no means unusual for the Tudor court. Jane threw herself to her knees, took the king's letter, kissed the seal, and returned it to the messenger, begging him to tell the king that she was a virtuous woman, and that she could only receive a present of money on her marriage to an honorable gentleman. Henry, always conservative, about his ideas about how virtuous women should behave, was thrilled about this response. He decided he would only see Jane if she was chaperoned by her family, and arranged with Cromwell that the minister should change apartment with Edward Seymour, so that the king could visit her regularly by the means of a private corridor. Over the spring of 1536, Jane drew support from a wide array of people as a potential queen. Descriptions of Jane does not give an especially favorable opinion of her appearance. She was fashionably fair-haired, but very pale, without the blushing cheeks that were admired. Whilst Chapoy did not think she was witty, he thought she probably had a good understanding. Henry might well have been tired of wit after ten years of Anne's witty tongue, and Catherine's ability to drive a point home. Jane was referred to as gentle and kind in private letters, and she was certainly willing to use her influence over Henry to promote the cause of Princess Mary, even to the extent of Henry rebuking her for not concentrating on her own offspring. By April, Plans were afoot for Anne's downfall. The Tudor legal system was not based on the notion of innocent until proven guilty. Instead, there was the general presumption that if a person were tried, he were likely to be guilty, or the king's officers would not have pursued the case. Jane's state of mind in May 1536 is, of course, a matter of conjecture. Having been part of Anne's household, she must have been aware that the charges was most likely false. Yet she may have thought Anne deserved death for her treatment of Catherine, and for the religious changes she had enabled, which James seemed to dislike. She is highly likely to have wanted to be queen, and she may even have felt genuine affection for Henry. He had enormous charm 
and Jay would not have been the first woman to think that her lover's wife did not understand him. Regardless of her feelings, Jane had no control over the trial and execution of Anne. The day after, she and Henry were formally betrothed and on May 29th, the couple were married. Jane made her first formal appearance as queen on June 2nd and her household were sworn in that day. Two days later, she was proclaimed queen at Greenwich and dined under the cloth of estate. Throughout the summer, Henry and Jane behaved as a honeymoon couple, with feasts and festivals. On June 15th, she rode beside Henry to Westminster Abbey, as part of the ceremonial surroundings to opening of the Parliament. Her train was carried by the King's own niece, Lady Margaret Douglas. She also received the customary visits from ambassadors, including the Imperial Ambassador Chapoy. During the early months of her tenure, Jane tried to persuade Henry to reconcile with his eldest daughter, Princess Mary. Her pleas were not sufficient to allow Mary back into favor. Without the princess first accepting that her parents' marriage was invalid. Once Mary had swallowed this bitter pill, she was welcomed back to her father's favor, and Jane and her new stepdaughter were soon on excellent terms. In 1536, a new act of succession were passed, naming Jane's children as his heirs. Whilst Jane was gratified by this, it also underlined her prime function, to bear a son. During the autumn of 1536, the rebellion known as the Pilgrimage of Grace broke out. Jane tried to intervene for at least one convent, and during her pregnancy, which began around the time of the rebellion, and its offshoots were finally squashed, Henry funded two monastic houses to pray for her. The coronation of Jane has first been planned for July, but then October 1537. The first postponement was probably due to plague in London, and the second because of the rebellion. Nevertheless, Jane received an excellent jointer as queen, and there was much rivalry for places in her household. She was always determined to be queen, more in the mold of Catherine than Anne, with more restraint and aloof manners towards her courtiers. In spring 1537, Jane finally fell pregnant. Her pregnancy progressed normally, although she expressed a strong craving for quail, rapidly supplied by Lady Lyle, who was keen to carry favor to place her own daughter in Jane's entourage. As the news of the impending birth spread around the country, there was widespread rejoicing with bonfires and thanksgiving services. On September 16th, Jane entered her period of confinement at Hampton Court. She went into labor less than a month later on October 9th. Following a smooth pregnancy, the labor was problematic. For three agonizing days she struggled, before delivering a long for son on October 12th. Henry and everyone up and down the country was jubilant. In accordance to customs, Jane remained in bed, signing letters announcing the birth to foreign courts. On October 15th, she was wrapped in furs and carried to a daybed to receive her courtiers after the christening. Shortly after, she began a fever and two days later received last rites. After a brief rally, she again deteriorated. Prayers were ineffectual and Jane died on October 24, 1537. She was buried the following month with all the ceremony that Henry's court was capable of. St. Paul's Chapel, Windsor. Henry mourned her sincerely and always referred to her as his most loved wife. She was painted beside him even after her death in a family portrait he commissioned in 1545. 
He also chose to be buried beside her. And that was all for Jane Seymour, and now we're going to talk about Anne of Cleves. Anne was the daughter of John III, Duke of Cleves, and Maria, the heiress to the Duchy of Julichburg. Both duchies were fiefdoms of the Holy Roman Empire. Anne was born in Düsseldorf Castle and the second of her parents' children to survive. She was given a very traditional education, supervised by her mother. She spoke only her native High Dutch and, whilst she was well versed in traditional skills of household management and needlework. She did not learn any of the courtly skills that was prevalent in the larger courts of Europe. During Anne's early childhood, a religious upheaval instigated by the Augustinian monk Martin Luther happened. In Cleves, Anne's father did not join the Lutheran party overtly, and Anne was brought up as a Catholic. During the early 1530s, Henry VIII of England considered entering into an alliance with the German princes. To gain support, for the annulment of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. But despite urging from his chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, he did not go further than discussion. The king preferred to maintain an alliance with Francois I of France against Charles V. Henry was firmly opposed to Luther and his followers, and Luther was equally unimpressed by Henry. By the late 1530s, the situation had changed. Francois I and Charles V had formed a defensive alliance, and Henry's council urged him to take a bride from Cleves. Henry himself was far more demanding in the matter of wives than most royal husbands. He had consciously chosen his previous wives, and he wanted a wife to love. Anne and her sister Amelia had in 1538 been mentioned as possible wives for Henry VIII. But it was mentioned that neither were considered particularly attractive or learned. But with few other avenues in 1539, emissaries were sent to Cleves. Negotiations were opened for Anne to marry Henry in 1538 much to the irritation of Charles V. Anne's father died in early 1539, and Anne's brother were left in charge of his sister's destiny. He was eager to promote the match, and envoys from England were sent to report on the suitability of Anne and her sister Amelia for a possible bride for King Henry. In August 1539, Hans Holbein, Henry's court painter, was dispatched to Cleves to paint Anne and Amelia. Before the matter could proceed to a conclusion, it had to be established that Anne was free to marry. There had perhaps been an earlier betrothal to the infant son of Duke of Lorraine. The Cleves' government reassured the English envoys that the discussion had not led to a binding betrothal. On October 4th, 1539, the marriage treaty was signed. As the seasons was now unfavorable for a sea journey, a safe conduct was requested from Mary of Hungary to allow Anne to travel overland to Calais. The permission was granted. Anne said goodbye to her family and set out for a foreign land and an unknown husband. On her arrival at Antwerp, she was greeted with enthusiasm by the English merchants of the city, who gave her a torchlit procession. As she entered English territory at Calais, guns were fired in salute. Because of the weather and unpredictable sea conditions, Anne remained in Calais for two more weeks. Anne passed time in learning to play English card games to speak some of the language of her new home. Presumably, she had never seen a ship or the sea before. All in all, Anne made an excellent impression. Whilst gracious, she was not over-familiar, and showed every sign 
of wanting to fit in with the English customs, even going as far as to ask about table manners. Anne's flotilla of 50 ships finally set sail two days after Christmas, arriving at Deal at 5 p.m. on December 27th, to be met by Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk, and his wife, Catherine Willby. The sea journey had been terrible and Anne was very seasick, but she had no time to rest, moving on to Dover Castle, then Bareham Downs, before arriving at the Bishop's Palace in Rochester on December 21st. Henry was now so impatient to meet his new bride that he decided to make an unannounced visit. It was a common courting trick for the groom to arrive incognito, and the lady who was supposed to recognize him, was to pretend to be overcome by his charm. Unfortunately, Anne was either completely unaware of this courtly game, or genuinely had no idea it was Henry that had bursted into her apartments at Rochester and tried to embrace her. She received the intruder coldly and continued to watch the bull baiting that was being carried on outside the window of our room. Henry was brought face to face with the fact that without his royal persona, a young lady would have no interest in him. He exited the room quickly and returned covered in purple velvet. The oohs and ahs of the assembled company. Anne, now realizing the magnitude of her error, humbled herself lowly. The betrothed couple conversed, probably through an interpreter for a polite length of time before Henry departed. He immediately told Cromwell that he was deeply disappointed, I like her not. It was immediately apparent that Henry found Anne deeply physically unappealing. Henry's first thought was to try to find a way out. Could Cromwell come up with a reason to stop the marriage? But such a move would be an insult of the most outrageous proportions. To reject the Duke of Cleves' sister like an unwanted parcel might drive Cleves back into the arms of the Emperor. The pre-contract with Lorraine was aired, but the Cleves delegation insisted that it had not been binding, and they would produce documentary evidence to prove what they were saying was true within three months. Cromwell and his other counselors informed the king that he had to go through with it. Preparations proceeded. Anne made a formal entrance into her new capital city, with a reception at Blackheath, where she was greeted by the court and her new family. Her three stepchildren, Mary, Elizabeth and Edward, Henry's niece, Lady Margaret Douglas, daughter-in-law, Mary, Duchess of Richmond. It was a grand affair and Anne was widely cheered. Whatever Henry thought, most people that met Anne seemed to like her. On January 5th, Anne confirmed that she was free to marry and Henry, despite murmuring that he was not well handled, had perforce to continue. They were married the following day in the Queen's closet at Hampton Court. After the usual festivities, the couple retired to bed. The following morning, when Cromwell asked his master how he had enjoyed his wedding night, the king replied he had not liked Anne before and liked her even less now. He later maintained that having a good feel of the merchandise could not be provoked or steered to know her carnally. Since the main purpose of this marriage, as far as Henry was concerned, was to increase his family, his inability to consummate posed a huge problem. He continued to make efforts to overcome his distaste for a few weeks, but his doctor told him to not overstrain himself. Consequently, he would go into bed, hold Anne's hand as he kissed her and bade her good night, and in the morning kiss her again before he was departing. Anne's ladies soon became aware that all was not well, and asked her about what was going on behind the bed curtains. As they were worried, 
that there were no signs of a pregnancy. Anne, either genuinely unaware of the facts of life, or feigning ignorance for her own reasons, told the ladies about Henry kissing her and asked if that was not enough. There must be more than that, Lady Rutland told her, before a Duke of York could materialize. But Anne was probably perfectly satisfied with being a queen without having to endure the intimate attention of her less than ideal husband. There was no question but that she should receive a full household and the jointer appropriate to her station. Amongst the Queen's new maids of honour was the attractive niece of the Duke of Norfolk, Catherine Howard. It was not long until the King noticed this vivacious girl. And since the political landscape of Europe had changed, leaving an alliance with Cleves as less valuable than before, he looked for a way to rid himself of Anne. Anne was not to be bundled off to the Tower on trumped-up charges. She was a foreign princess, and even if Henry didn't find her attractive, he had no personal animosity against her. Instead, two arguments were put forward on which an annulment could be based. The first was a pre-contract with Francois of Lorraine. The second was the king's inability to consummate the marriage, which conveniently proved to be caused by his inner knowledge that the marriage to a woman pre-contracted elsewhere was invalid. On June 26th, Anne was directed to move to Richmond Palace away from the rest of the court, on the pretext that it was plague in the air. She probably had no inkling that the next day she would receive a delegation from the council with astonishing news. And Anne's response was that she would accept whatever Henry thought was right. She wrote a letter to Henry accepting that their marriage was invalid and returned her wedding ring. She signed herself Anna, the daughter of Cleves. Henry was in many ways a generous man and he was now open-handed about his treatment of Anne. She was the rank immediately after any new queen and his current and any future daughters. She was also granted estates to the value of £3,000 per year, not a great deal less than the Queen's jointer, and the same annual amount that Henry would settle on his daughters in his will. The one stipulation was that Anne would remain in England. She was well treated and honoured, but she was a hostage for her brother's consent. Thus, Henry had all the benefits of a marriage with Cleves, without having to live with a woman he found unattractive. One of the first acts of obedience required by the former queen was for her to share the humiliating story of her rejection with her brother. Anne initially suggested that she would prefer someone else to break the news. But the Duke of Suffolk persuaded her, no doubt with Copius' hints of what would happen to disobedient subjects. The right to Wilhelm. The letter emphasized how happy she was obeying God's will. And whilst she could not have Henry as a husband, his merit as a brother was extolled. She hoped that Wilhelm would continue the alliance. Once the annulment was completed and Henry had married Catherine, Henry and Anne seemed to get on well. He was invited to court from time to time and treated Catherine with all the respect due to a queen. And Henry visited her. She had received Hever Castle, Richmond Palace and Bletchingley Manor, amongst other properties, as a part of the financial settlement. After Henry's death, Anne became increasingly concerned about money. Her settlement had been extremely generous and she wrote several letters both to the council and to her home about the cost of everything. In 1553, when Mary became queen, Anne travelled in the first carriage behind the new sovereign to her coronation, seated beside Elizabeth. She wrote a number of letters home suggesting 
that she wanted to return to Cleves, but there was no prospect of that. She remained on good terms with Mary, visiting court from time to time. In early 1557, whilst living in Chelsea, she fell ill and died in July of that year. Her will made generous bequests to charities and nominated gifts for friends and family. The funeral was carried out with royal pomp, paid for by Queen Mary, and was laid to rest in Henry VII Chapel in Westminster Abbey. Well, that was all for this time. The next video will be out June 2nd and will be about the last two queens of Henry VIII, Catherine Howard and Catherine Parr.